My name is Morsen, and I'm a denim light designer. I'm a lecturer and a historian as well, and I teach at lots of lots of, of colleges, and I consult for lots of people from Tencel, Circular, Renew Cell, um, Cone, Bossa, um, and worked for many, many mills and lots and lots of companies, including like Levi's Japan and lots of other ones as well. But that's not really about that today. So you know me already, so there's no need to go into that. I do run a consultancy, and I run it together with my wife, Sadia, who's more than 50% of the company that we run, but I seem to take credit for all the work that we do. But it's, it's her as well, so it's quite important that she And I teach as well, that's me uh, sort of teaching like, at the end, but I've been in many, many like, publications, and uh, yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit too many I've been in now, so it's getting a bit silly, but it's quite fun. Um, denim's interesting because it leaves an imprint. It's one of the only fabrics, including like sort of leather, where you can, it molds to you, and you can often judge and often find out what a person was doing from the wear marks that that person was wearing. Here's, this example is obviously a table, and you can see uh, the marks of the wood actually coming through, which is quite, quite amazing. But denim is quite remarkable. And the reason it does this is actually from the way that the yarn itself has been dyed. That's ring spinning, where the core is still white. That's the reason why denim is actually, actually denim. Otherwise, it will be a chino pant, which doesn't really fade that, that well. Um, but we, let's just start right now. Obviously, this year is quite interesting because it's actually the anniversary year of the patent. Um, so in May 20th, uh, 1873 is when like, Levi Strauss and Jacob, Jacob, Jacob Davis were awarded the patents. But at least one or two years earlier than that, Jacob, J Jacob Davis was actually messing around with like, sort of rivets, didn't have enough money, went to his customer, which was Le Levi Strauss, and then they went halves on the actual like, sort of rivet patents. So that's how our story here actually, actually like, sort of, sort of like, begins. But the amazing thing is, the rivet it, it, it itself, it, it pretty much standardized how garments are made to a point where you can actually date things pre-rivet and after the sort of like rivet. So this is a very early example of one of the earlier 1873 jeans. It's only got one pocket, twin, twin needle stitch is most likely a like 3 16th. And what's remarkable about it is it's all single needle like tailored. Even the edges of the seams are still raw, which is quite sort of cool. And this is an example that I've got. I've got lots of pieces in my archive, actually, of, of this sort of era. I've got one, one of the, one of the Wu, Wu styles as well, which is quite, quite amazing. But um, it's lovely to see these early styles because they have like, leather inside them as well to, to actually have like, a cushioning effect. So quite, be quite beautiful to see. The great thing about the patents it is that Levi Strauss and Jacob Davis were quite clever. They actually put the date of the patents on the actual rivet, which is quite, quite nice. And they started doing it on the back first. So yeah, that's quite cool. So these garments were made for a purpose. They were made for miners and miners only. They weren't fashion garments yet. That doesn't happen until the 1930s or, or like 40s. So they were made for this sort of purpose. That's why most jeans in this era were only right, most people were right-handed, only needed one back pocket, which is quite sort of like remarkable. And early examples can still be found today. You can still find them, but they go for extortionate amounts, up to $100,000 for an 1890s pant. So that's, you know, that's a lot, that's an era after the 1870s sort of period. But the interesting thing is about this period is, it's around the 1897 period where we started to switch from natural indigo to chemical indigo. So these earlier pieces are very sought, sought, sought after for their wear, wear patterns, but also for the fact that they were using nat natural indigo. So it's quite nice to see. If you manage to get, manage to get one, it's actually quite a remarkable thing to, add, to actually find, which is quite sort of cool. So what actually came first? You know, um, I always thought, I was always told it was a duck garment because the reason why we know, know this is because on the actual very first leather patch, it does clearly say duck and, and denim like clo sort of clothing. So denim wasn't really invented by Levi's. There were many other companies actually using an indigo uh, ring dyed sort of, fa sort of fabric, but Levi Strauss for sure in the earlier period, we're talking in the first year or so, they used both. That's why their, le 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 their leather patch for that era still says denim and duck, cl duck clothing. And here's an example of the actual duck canvas that they were sort of using. It's a two by two. By two. It's got the, sel got the selvage there too. And if you notice, they've actually not felled, but they've butted both the seams like sort of, sort of like together. And it's still raw as well on like the inside. Obviously, it's got a, sel got a selvage edge. But it's really quite nice to see. But if anyone ever argues with you what came first, duck or denim, I believe it was duck because Doc was the one that was on the actual patent, but on the leather patch, the very first patch, it says both. So it's a bit of a gray area, but Levi's historian, Tracy Panic even told me it, it most likely was a, was a duck, but both are actually mentioned. 
So these early, early garments, where was the position of some of the details that we still, we still have, like, have like today? So this is an example of an 1873 style, extremely rare. It's still got one back pocket, but the leather patch, or sorry, the canvas patch, or, 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 or the leather patch was actually right in the center, center back. So it's quite nice to see. If you ever come across these styles, it's, be it's beautiful to see. You also see the twin needle stitching. Some of it could be one eighth, some of, some of it could, could, could be a, like, sort of, a, like three sixteenths. And there's only single needle going around the actual pocket edge, edge too, and the buttonholes were all done by hand. So there are lots of telltale signs if you do come across one like in the wild make sure you grab it. But yeah, the, one of these, we're talking 100,000 or like more now. So yeah, very, very rare, actually fine. But luckily for us, Levi's have, like re, have like reproduced it this year. So if you're one of the lucky 150, 150 people have managed to grab themselves this actual pair. So I managed to grab th this one here, but I was very, very, un very, very unlucky and I never got to manage to grab the raw style. But if you notice here, on the actual rivet, there is a leather washer like in between it. So these are quite sort of be beautiful things to actually find. But make sure you grab this earlier style because it literally, they've one-to-one -one gone back and they've even gone beyond their own archive. Because in their archive, from my understanding, they haven't got the, er the earliest piece. So they had to go somewhere else to double check exactly what the measurements were and what the actual, actual, de actual details were on this 1873 pant. So it's quite fun to see. And we see the raw picture here. Here we go. Here's the raw style that they only made 100, 150 pieces of. I think even none made it even like into the UK. I put, or put an order down. I think it's like 800 pounds or something. I still didn't get it. So mad, madness. I'm sure someone's going to be, I think I found one on eBay only like last week and it was already double that price. So not really worth it because I, I already know exactly how this gene is actually, actually like constructed. So I could probably like reproduce it quite well from all the evidence and like photographs that I've at actually got. But what's nice is it comes in a nice tin or a, t a time capsule, uh, as they say, and a nice little, the actual picture or a, a like, certificate of the actual patent, which is quite fun. Okay, so there's some evidence, only some, that the earliest, earliest gene well, was a canvas. And obviously, if it was a canvas, then it most likely could have been hemp. Now, Levi's themselves have said that's not true. And I think, you know, I think all, it's pointing towards that like, actual like, direction. Only because like sort of, sort of Amistad Cotton and Wool manuf Manufacturing Company, which supplied like Levi's first, they were mostly using, as it says, wool and, and like cotton. But canvas itself is an Arabic word, it's an Arabic word for hemp. So most likely it could have been hemp. And there's lots of evidence that hemp's from that 1870s period were were canvases and they could have been in, in like America. We might find it, we might not. Levi's are saying it's not true, but it might be in someone's cupboard or it might be still down a, a mine shaft. Who knows? But there's some evidence, but everyone's saying it might not be true, but it could be true. So it's quite fun. So what are the kind of machines these early garments were made on? I'm like a machine, like sort of a cra crazy person. I've got more than 30 different machines in my workshop now. I would love to get my hands on one of these, but I think my wife would probably like, sort of like castrate me. This, the earliest machines that we know Levi Strauss actually used, he put an advert out and he put an advert in, 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 like, in like the newspaper and he clearly says he wants, he, he wants ladies to bring their own, own machine and it has to be either a Singer number two or a Grover and Baker number one. So they're the actual machines that the very first jeans were made on, or the very first Levi's jeans were made, made on. And um, there's only one designer that I know, num only denim designer that I know, that uses both machines, and it's a denim designer in like New York called ba Bowery Blue. He managed to, God knows how he got one, because these are like sort of like museum, got, uh, they're like museum pieces, so he's using it in production, which is crazy. So yeah, but I'd love to have a go on one of them. It should be really, really fun, or really annoying, but it's quite fun. So the machines that we now use, and uh, some of us are in, in, in the world of like, manufacturing, anything from six to eight machines to 12 machines, I've got more than 30 machines. It really depends on how fast and how, how automated you want your process to actually be. You, know, you can make a pair of jeans with probably only three machines, you know, a lock stitch machine, a buttonhole machine, and probably a bar tack machine. You know, and that's probably, and a buttonhole machine. Anyway, I might have said that. But you don't need all these machines to do it, especially if you're making them in a really professional way. Now, this method of making jeans, I would say is probably the Primark or 
you know, the lower end of the market scale. It's all surges. It's, you know, and it's fine. It, they make a gene in a couple, couple, couple of minutes, especially if you've got a person op operating each, each process. Nothing wrong with it, but that's not what this pre the actual presentation is about. I'm going to show you the method that goes against all of this. So it's going to be quite fun. So interestingly, when the patent of the rivet was in force, from 1873 all the way up to 1890, no one else could use rivets. They weren't allowed. I'm sure some people did, and they probably got sued. So everyone had to come up with ingenious ways of reinforcing and adding strength in their garment. Now, this is very much a period that we're in now, where all, I, me as a denim designer, I'm moving away from like, rivets. I don't want to use them any, anymore because they're difficult to take off when you like recycle a garment. So I'm even more interested in this early period because people were coming up with really ingenious ways of adding strength in garments. So this is actually a repro garment from a Japanese company called Warehouse. And it's a reproduction of, of, of a garment from this period. If you notice, the coin pocket is going into the waistband for strength. And the edges of the actual pockets themselves, where rivets would be, they put dark, dark light stitches. The back is also awesome, awesome as well. And notice another, another thing that's cool. The top of the waistband is tiny. They've actually wrapped it around the back. This is a really early method of doing like waist, well, waistbands, which many designers don't do now. And I think it looks quite beautiful. I've done it a lot in my own, own brand. And it's also got a, a crotch like, sort of, a re, sort of a reinforcement. And the twin needling is magical. We got a 3 16th on the waistband, a 1 8th going down, and also a 1 8th single needle going down the center front. These are measurements that we hardly use now, and it looks absolutely beautiful and tailored. And that twin needling going down the side, side seam too. It's, it's actually quite magical, all of these measurements, because they make the garment look so beautiful and so tailored. So always make sure you have a look at the garments like this. And this is quite funny. Levi's themselves actually went ahead and reproduced a similar, similar garment. So they had the patent. They could use rivets. But they decided to do another range, which was mainly for miners and farmers and like mechanics. And they had decided to put dart, dart, dart stitching and all these clever things that their competitors were doing on their own styles. So this is actually a, a like Levi's garment. So it's interesting to see um, you know, Levi's themselves um, you know, getting influenced or, or, or using other people's ideas as well, which is quite normal. There's a lot of, like, of like cross-pollination happening in this early period. Um, this is something quite fun. I do a lot of this work. I, often get really old bits of denim, maybe from friends, or actually go and buy them, like bits that are found down mine shafts. This is an example that a friend of mine, uh, Warpface uh, Duncan, managed to find, or managed to get from Michael Allen Harris, a very, very well-known denim enthusiast, uh, sort of historian as well. He bought it from him. We both knew it was from this patent here, which is from the cruise closed front jumper. So from me measuring this actual piece of denim, I worked out the kind of fit it, it would have been in that period, and I recreated it. Obviously, it's me guessing, but it's very well informed guessing. I know the types of fits that this period would have. I've got similar kind of blocks from this period. I know the kind of measurements they would have used, and I know there will be no raw edges or anything like that. So I recreated it the best I could, and we used a dead stock um, cone fabric for it as well, which was quite awesome. So really beautifully, nice little project. But, um, I love doing projects like this because it only takes a day or so to do it. He comes in the morning and he goes in the, goes in the evening and he's got a reproduction of a garment, which is, you know, a guess of what's happening. But it's a really beautiful way of, wor of, of like, working. And a lot of other designers have done, some less, have done similar things. There's an another example of me. This is a, uh, I think a 1930s or 40s kid's um, Wrangler piece, um, which is quite, be quite beautiful. It's got the dot, got the dot tacks going down it. I recreated it using a leftover bosser fabric that I like, created. And I, create, I literally done it like one to one. So it's quite a fun example. But there's a lot of people that are examining a lot of historical garments to learn, learn, learn from. Don't be afraid of picking some of these things up because they don't make many of them. They're talking maybe half a dozen, uh, 20 pieces maximum that these styles are made. They're, it's like kind of like sort of like enthusiasts like me who recreate them. And you can learn so much about the denim world, this early period, this magical period between 1873 to 1890, the period that I'm more interested in. Here's more examples of it as well. These are more examples of the garments that were made in that period without rivets, which is quite, quite remarkable. And this is an example, the next one that's coming up now, is a sample that actually um, Mike Harris made. So this is quite, quite beautiful. It's quite beautiful because it's actually recreated from the original. And you can see 
the twin needle stitching going down. You can see how beautiful it is, and they've recreated it the best they can, and they've gained so much more knowledge like, from it. So it's quite a beautiful way to work, and then that can inform you on how you would probably design your own. So even the waistband is much more bigger than we normally do. It's more like a trouser or a military type waistband. It's much, much more wider, which is quite interesting. But again, the pocket itself is anchored in through the cinch and through the top of the waist, waist, waistband. And it's got the magic like 3 16th as well, which is quite, amaz quite, quite amazing. And more examples of it now. These are, these are modern styles now. These are styles that you know, are only 10 years old. This is from a Japanese company called John Bull. And that's, that's from that sort of a Stevenson overall. Both these companies have been examining really old workwear styles to get influence to do stuff like, stuff like this. Even to the, the slight curve of the pocket, that normally happens when you wear a style for a very long time. And over time, it starts getting a curve from your hands going inside. But they've engineered it so it's got a beautiful curve in it. And, and this curve, it's more like a 5 16th edge stitch. It's more, you know, it's like a 3 quarters inch goes down to a quarter or 3 16th and goes round again. Really elegant and beautiful. The Stevenson, oh, Stevenson, oh, Stevenson oh, sort of overall one is a lot more elegant how it's being, being made, but it's got big old like, rivets on there as well. So it's quite beautiful, quite beautiful to see. These are the kinds of examples that I show to a lot of my actual students. And we can't talk about pockets without talking about a detail that a lot of us denim enthusiasts love, love to this day. And if you come across a concealed like, rivet nowadays, you'll only really find it on vintage garments from the 30s or 40s, or you'll find it on like, Japanese like, sort of, like, sort of, sort of, sort of like, repro garments. It was actually invented by this guy here. It's called, he's called Milton Grambon. This is quite beautiful, because this, 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 this guy here, I found the original patent, but I didn't have his picture. So I went into some old Levi's catalogs on the, on the internet, the ones that people have scanned in, and I managed to find a picture of the actual like, gentleman here. So he's quite cool. But then, obviously, me being more historian, I want to know more about him. This guy has invented a detail which is practically on every single um, workwear garment, especially premium garment. And he said, yes, I appreciate the bonus, and you know I need it. I'm supporting my mother and father, but I can't accept the bonus unless you give a bonus to every single girl in the factory as well. What an absolute dude. What an absolute dude. This guy, you know, in the 19, 1930s was supporting women. So I thought, let's put his, put his picture up, even though our friends at Levi's don't, and let's, uh, let's bring more light to, this, ama to, this, this, ama to this, this sort of amazing guy. Um, another cool detail which goes alongside that is the blind bar tack. This is something that you, you would find also in connection with the, with the concealed rivet, but many people do it without a rivet. So it's basically where, before you attach the pocket on, you can do a bar tack or even a stitch across the top, and you give it a good pull, and you create that grinning stitch. We call it in English a like grinning stitch, a bit like a like Cheshire cat. Most brands, they put a different color through the grinning stitch so you can clearly see it. This doesn't cost anything at all. This is something that you just tell the, fa the factory to do, and it automatically upgrades your garment from a crap garment to an absolutely premium garment in one, one step. So it's quite an amazing like, detail that doesn't cost anything. So yeah, and then coin pockets. I get really frustrated with students and young designers who just copy a Levi's jean or Lee jean or whatever, and they think they've done something amazing. No, you, you know, you can easily figure out that a like, diesel pocket right there, but you can be a bit more experimental with your coin pockets. And even me having a, a bit of a, a peekaboo salvage with a chain stitch like runoff with, you know, coin pockets that are influenced from the past, oh, so why not? Even curving the bottom of your coin pockets or, you know, but. Definitely have an experiment with your coin, coin pocket. Don't just copy Levi's the whole, the, the whole talk time. Bearers. This is something quite interesting. I've had a nice discussion with a lot of our... our I've got, I'm in a denim group with a lot of people like in the UK, and we've been discussing, what is this detail called on a jean? I was always told this detail is called a bearer. But some designers call it a facing, and some designers call it something else. So it's really weird. Anyway. A facing in the fashion world is something that's hidden. So it can't be called a facing because that's something that's hidden. So it's definitely, in my point of view, called a bearer. So let's talk about it. So crap bearers are the ones that I've got a bit of overlocking and they're slapped on. Not bad ones are cleaned up. Ultra premium ones are, are salvaged. And then an, an uber duber hard, or hardcore one is using the actual fabric as the actual pocket bag and having no bearer. So that's what they used to do like, in the past. So don't be afraid of experimenting with your bearers or no bearers. It's quite fun. And then the fly stitch. This is something that can easily, you can figure out if it's a premium jean or something quite elegant, is the shape of the fly. This particular one is done by a really great Dutch designer, but it's gone from a, a one eighth all the way down to nothing. And it's so ele elegantly done, it's much more long, long, longer as well. So don't be afraid of experimenting with your whips when it comes to your twin needle stitch. 
which is quite fun. And then we can't talk about the fly without mentioning the detail which I've been promoting my whole career, uh, more, than, more than 20 years now. It's, it's the actual like, continuous fly. So I made this detail quite famous. Me and Jason Denham and probably one, one other designer are the ones that only, only used it like 12, like 13 like years ago. And many designers tend to not use it still, which I find quite funny. Because this detail is so strong, you can use a zipper version with it as well, salvage and non sort of, like, sort of, sort of like salvage. And it's so elegant. Even these early workwear styles, you know, they had it. There's a period in time where people use continuous flies or continuous stitch flies, which is quite fun. And even me, I do an elegant one now where it goes from fat to thin and, you know, with non salvage. So there's no reason why you can't actually do it. And it's beautiful and it's super, super, super strong. And then, you know, but I've. I've, had, I've got a love-hate relationship with, with overlockers and surges. If any of you have listened to any of my talks before, you know, I think it's a sign of a bad designer. Probably, maybe, but may, maybe not. You know, you can, I've now come to a nice place in my life where I'm saying, okay, I can live with an overlocker, but it has to work with many other types of stitches. And it's like in, uh, it's doing something quite fun. So this one here is quite beautiful. It's got a chain stitch runoff, bit of selvage, and the other side is overlocked. So I accept, I, I accept that. This is a style which is obviously quite wide, so they did have to overlock it. Yes, they could have bound it, but they want to keep things flat. So I've come to con you know, a recent conclusion that I can live with it, but only, I only accept it if it's in the combination with other stitches. If the entire garment is overlocked, then we're talking about something else here. So if it's in the combination of something, mostly, mostly for bulk or that kind of reason, then it's, for me, it's just about acceptable. So yeah, and then buttons as well. This is quite fun. Um, I love developing buttons. I develop a lot of buttons. But something that I've come, you know, I came, I, I found out about uh, butcher buttons about 12 years ago. And then I ended up doing a project with this company called MTTR. And they told me we would like to have removable buttons. So this is a button. It's a really old type of button where you squeeze the middle bit and the button comes away. And actually, all really early buttons were like this because all buttons were like removable. So this is a really early example of a removable shank button. And you can still make, make, still make, them, like, make them today. He managed to find like thousands of them. So in his production, he just gave me really old dead stock ones. But I'm sure one or two of the trim suppliers, it would be awesome if they actually went ahead and made more butcher, butcher buttons. It would be quite fun. So the, the middle bit you pinch, and it literally comes away. It's quite beautiful. But my, my take on that was doing a removal button, which is a screw on, which I did a few years ago. And I did develop it for cone, and I developed it with coats as well. And yeah, and then both YKK, Prim, all the major trim suppliers now do removable buttons. Uh, there's actually no excuse we should all just be switching to a removable button. Um, and real rivets. Now, I've, I've come to the conclusion that actually rivets probably aren't the best thing now. So yes, is a jean really a jean if it doesn't have a rivet? I don't know. It, it, the rivet is the reason why we're all here, because of the invention of the rivet. But this is an example of a real rivet. And I, I, I ask each of you to go home and check if your denim jeans are real rivets, because real rivets have a telltale sign where the fabric is actually poking through the middle. Tiny bit. Um, so even many well-known companies decide not to use real rivets anymore. But a real rivet, if you're going to use a rivet, do a real washer and bar. If you're not going to do a rivet, then I would suggest do, do, do something else. So a bar tag or something. This is quite cool as well. Lots of details that I keep on finding. Keep on finding. You know, I was doing my research only up until even, even last night. I was still adding to this, like, pres to, to this like, presentation. But this is quite cool. This is a detail that was found in Michael Allen Harris's book. And it's a detail where... The, uh, the pocket itself is, re is, actually re is actually reinforced with a, de with a detail from the actual pocket bag, and it's stitched on. So it's added extra protection. And obviously, we know now why, because this is when the, when the rivet was in force. So that's come up with clever like, details to try and reinforce that garment so it wouldn't rip. So quite a lovely like, sort of like, detail. And little tricks that you know, may most people don't, don't realize that happen. Even on the pocket bags that, and things that we make today, even I do it when I teach. I construct it so it's more bigger, so it's easier to put your hand in the garment. These are unnoticeable things, but even in this early, you know, this pattern, you can actually see the pocket bag is wider. So that one quarter or three sixteenth will give a little bit of extra room when you put your hand in. These are things that factories do without you even knowing. So but these are things that you often find in early, early workwear garments too, which is quite fun. And then you can also enhance them by putting twill tape on the inside as well to enhance it even more, or even a facing, a facing panel too. Um, this is quite fun that I've been finding quite a lot. I've been finding a lot of this in military garments and some denim and workwear now. Uh, this is a, a Levi's um, 
replica garment, and they've actually stitched the, the, the shirt button in such a way that it looks like a little leaf, which is quite awesome. And then there's a denim designer in like New York, our friend, like Bow Bowery Blue again, and he does a similar kind of thing where he puts, puts holes in, and every single leather patch has this little detail. So don't be afraid of doing a little, you know, I call it a like decorative detail. Actually, it's quite a beautiful thing to do. And you don't have to tell anyone about it. You just like discover it, especially on the shirt button, which is tiny. So it's quite a lovely thing to actually like discover, which is quite fun. And then little things that you might not have come, come across. I come across it now all the time because I look for this. Um, inside garments, sometimes the, the, the chain stitch part of, of it, the, basically the chain, chain stitch thread, if it's especially a twin needle or a triple needle, one of the colors might be slightly off. What they do is in factories, to, um, to make, I know this from going to many factories, you have a project and you get loads of leftover colors from a project and no one wants to use that color because it's someone else's color. So what these factories they used to do, they used to hide the stitch inside a garment on a stitch that you would never actually see. They'll hide it in one of the sort of things. So it's a little lovely detail to find and you can also work out which factory made that garment by the types of colors they were actually, actually using. So lots of, uh, I think a PhD, someone needs to do a PhD just about this and find out where all these garments are actually made, which would be quite fun. Cotton concepts, um, one of our speakers earlier, like Jordan just talked about it uh, earlier, but yeah, he's right. Um, colored cotton is, is not new. One of the earliest garments that we know of was most likely a colored cotton, that early duck garment. So colored cotton was primarily used for slaves. It was actually meant for them. And, you know, and, and that's what it was. And it's interesting to see that these early garments were using colored cotton. So these early garments were literally for workwear, for wearing out, for doing manual labor. They weren't at all garments to like treasure. So they used the cheapest cotton they can. Obviously, quite, quite ironic, now this type of cotton is is more associated with organic and quite beautiful. And so, but these early strains, they are really nice colors. And Bossa themselves have developed quite a lot of strains, which they've done themselves. And I think they're onto a winner. So I love colored cotton. I like the idea of making a garment that doesn't use any dye at all. So that's, for me, is awesome. Um, cotton concepts. This is something that I do a lot in my job. I, I work out, I uh, look at an old garment and I try and figure out where, what kind of cotton it was, where it was from. This is a, a little snapshot of someone else's slide. I wasn't allowed to steal the whole thing, but you can actually see this garment was probably from about 1910 or something, but it would have been originally a, uh, a, one of these earlier cotton strains up here, but cotton, just like our food, has been like genetically like modified so much. It's quite unrecognizable, really, but they did it for a reason. They did it for better strains. They did it, they did it for other reasons to make it stronger to make it more, more, you know, for the reasons that they do to make, make, make to, to splice things together. So these earlier strains are much harder to find or pretty much extinct, but it's very difficult to replicate that exact gene. Yes, you can pattern cut it. You can get the cotton similar to it. You can, you can mess with it. You can even engineer the slub pattern, but um, why engineer it when you can just get the actual original cotton to do it? But quite beautiful to see these earlier strains and seeing someone map, map out a tree of how cotton has been uh, genetically like, modified. Quite fun. Um, the earliest known mummified garment that we know of at the moment, that's an actual real garment, is this one here. It was found in somewhere in, in China, and, in, in, in the, and it's about 3,000 years old. The funny thing is about this garment, there's a whole documentary about it. I, I go on YouTube, it's a 50-minute documentary just about this one style, and they've mapped it all out. They've done animations, and it's pretty amazing. Um, but this style was actually zero waste as well. So it was actually woven in that shape and put together. Um, with a linking stitch. So it's quite remarkable that this garment was zero waste at the same time. So, you know, fabrics back then, you wouldn't make three meters of fabric or whatever it is and cut into it and waste more than 20 or 30%. You would try and pattern cut or engineer the entire thing. So it's something that they were doing many years ago, 3,000 years ago. So, you know, it's quite something that's not new. And the slides on the left, these are just examples of really old types of stitches because I always remind people up until the 1850s or so, everything was more pattern orientated. Nowadays, look around the room, we're all wearing plain garments. It wasn't like that at all. It was all about pattern and identity. So it's interesting to see. Uh, the types of weave patterns that we see whenever we go around a fair, like, like, like sort of this one is probably three different types, you know, uh, a three by one left, left hand twill, right hand twill, and then a broken twill, maybe some kind of weird jacquard or, or orient, but it's interesting. So these are the ones that mostly do most of the business. But the interesting thing to see is how much of the core of the yarn itself, the, the warp yarn, is only dyed. And, it's, and you know, when it gets uh, picked off, you can see how much of the core of it is only, it's, it's still white. So it's quite, it's quite interesting to see. Getting to the interesting slides now. So this is, um, 
one of the earliest known trucker jackets. Um, there's many, we've been wearing jackets forever and like um, aprons and protection garments, but Levi's themselves knew about this style and Michael Allen Harris, that famous historian, managed to find one and he sold it to like sort of like Levi's. It says here, um, it was, I think it's for like 50K or something. It's worth like double or like quadruple that now. But the amazing thing about this style is we finally have one to examine and you can clearly see the pleats, it's a triple pleated blouse, it's not double pleated, and the pleats are about 1cm or about 8 or 9 mil. Um, it's like a 5 apes kind of thing. And I managed, and the twin needle going around the pocket is actually a like 3 16 so in some cases it's actually a like sort of like 1 8 as well. It's absolutely stunning, even the shape is beautiful. It's so, so elegant how it's been put together. And I managed to see the garment um, last summer. I'm putting together a book which should be out in the autumn. So yeah, me and uh, Tracy Panic there looking over the actual style, which is quite lovely. Um, and here's the, re here's the reproduction that actually, uh, Levi's have made. And you can still find them. You know, there's one or two on eBay even right now if you want to get one. And I recommend that you do because these are historical garments that they've pattern cut against the real one. Yes, they've done all the grading and they've made it a commercial garment. But when you see it, you can see actually how it's made. Even Bowery Blue, our friend in New York, he replicated this exact, exact style. And the pleats, you can see how beautiful it is when you replicate it and you use the right 10 ounce lightweight denim for fabric. It washes down beautifully like an overshirt. It's quite stunning. Anyway, anyway. And then here's the type one where everyone believes it all started. We all know now it, it started with the triple pleated blouse, you know, much more earlier. And then we get the type two, the very, very famous like type two where like sort of Marion Brando and James, Neal, all those guys are wearing this actual style here. And we get the type three, which is the one that's known as a trucker jacket, the one that we find in all flea markets now. Um, still highly prized, especially if it's a blanket line one or one of the earlier ones from like 1960. If you find one from the 80s or even early, early 90s, you know, it's still quite nice. But this one, now we've got to a garment that's refined, it's shaped, it's engineered, it's, it's all form fitting, it doesn't even lie straight. It's like an, it's like an ergonomic garment. So it's amazing from a, the blocky fitted garment they got down to an engineered one. Indigo, let's talk about indigo. Um, this is quite a funny slide. I put, it, I put it on here to upset people, but actually there's something normal, there's something interesting going, going on here. The indigo leaves around the side are from my own garden. I took that picture last week, I grow indigo. This guy in the middle is called Abu Bakr Fofana. He's an indigo guy in Mali. We actually flew him to the, U, U, to the UK to teach us how to do indigo dyeing. This is way before it became cool or fashionable to do indigo dyeing. We're talking like 10, that was all about 10 years ago. But he actually has a farm, he's an indigo farmer, and he dyes his animals and he shears them and he, he does art installations from it. It's quite interesting what he does. But yeah, this, this picture is purely there to upset people. But it's quite harmless, it's, nat it's natural. I don't think that poor animals are enjoying it, but they go around the farm and it wears off and then he like, shears them, so it's, it's all fine. Um, but let's talk about the indigo history in, in Europe. We always, okay, indigo to me is quite interesting because indigo and cotton, were first cultivated and harvested in the Indus Valley region, which is in modern-day Pakistan, if you, if you didn't know. But there is a European story as well, which we can't ignore, which many people don't talk about. So our European friends, especially our, our, our French and, and Italian friends, they were harvesting woad, but they did, they did a different type of weave where they did, they did the weft was indigo and the warp was ecru. That's the first thing they did. And they used hemp and they used linen and they used wool. So they did many different types of, of, of combinations, but it's beautiful. And there's some early examples that, that, that still exist. And our friends, our friends Candiani, they replicated it quite recently for a diesel project. I wish I got my hands on like, some of it, and I didn't. But it, apparently the fabric was beautiful. It was like a lovely, a very l lightweight weave. Um, I just have to speak to Simon and try and see if I can get a, get, get a little piece to examine. But yeah, quite a beautiful, beautiful project, which went full circle for them because our friends at Candiani are from that region. So they felt, they, you know, they felt ownership to try and like, recreate it, which is quite cool. But indigo for us, you know, indigo, it's a petrochemical. All the indigo that we use right now in, in this room is all petrochemical based. It's, it's one of the evilest like, substances ever, super carcinogenic. Every single time we wear away a gene, we break away a gene. That indigo petrochemical plastic goes into the environment, goes into fish, it's airborne. We got a credit card amount of poly polyester plastic in us right, right, right now. It isn't the future at all. And we know that, our industry knows that. And there's lots of things that PPB people are doing. Our friends like Tencel are sort of like lensing. They produced a newer type of model. Okay, it's not, it's not Lysel, it's, it's one before Lysel, but it's still sort of model. They managed to inject at the dope stage. This is the gloopy stage 
when Lysel is being made or Modal is being made and they injected it with the indigo dye. Yes, it was a petrochemical, petrochemical based sort of indigo dye, which is a bit of a, a bad one. But now this particular version of a yarn, it doesn't crock and many people have managed to spin it. They managed to wrap it around a, a white core. So it's quite interesting. So this is an interesting, there's still lots of things going on here, but then the future really is in bacteria-based indigos. It's indigo that's based on a bacteria-based formula, still from that natural sort of indigo. And our friends at Hue are, are probably one of the ones that are leading it. There's a few others that are like contenders as well. Six to 10 years, we're gonna be using it. So it's very exciting. Hopefully it won't be too expensive, but there will be a big monopoly and the two big chemical companies in the world that own indigo are going to go after these guys for sure. So it's, it's interesting to see, but we know we're heading in, the, in a good direction. Um, laser, laser finishing. I'm, my claim to fame is I did one of the very first laser collections for Levi Japan back in 2002. This is quite fun. So this is a laser. I pattern cut it myself, and then I engineered it myself, and it was a really fun collection, a big, big collection. Uh, you can find it, not really, only, only about you know, 100 pieces were ever made, and that's it. I've got one set of each piece and I will be publishing it in my book because hardly no one knows about this collection, so it's quite fun. Um, but Levi's, uh, they, have a, they, have a, uh, they have copies of each one in their, in, the, in their archive. This is well before we could get like photorealistic garments. This is just, you know, these are all the shades you can do up until it burns. And I remember I made the collection and then every single time the burning line went over the stitch, actually the stitch became weak. So this is really early days of thread, thread development as well, which is quite fun. Um, this slide is misplaced, it should be a bit earlier, but for me, you know, um, embroidered bar tacks are, are such a beautiful thing. I actually went out and bought myself a machine that can do it. I think I'm the only one in the UK that has this machine, which is quite funny. Everyone else uses some weird attachment, but I've got the actual machine that does this. So, I, so it's why I'm quite happy to have it. And it's a good investment because I've used it quite a lot. But you can actually embroider anything, anything in a four by six rectangle. I managed to find the actual original patent that Wrangler had for their dot tack, and I plotted it in the same way. So it's a one-to-one -one, uh, re repro reproduction of their dot tack. But I did it in many collections, including one that I did for like, our friends, for like, friends at like Navina quite recently. Um, so these very early garments, we're going, we're going back and forth a lot, I, I apologize. So these early, 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 early garments, the earliest examples that we know about actually had self-fabric pocket bags, which is something that I actually did in my own zero waste pattern cutting collection quite recently, only because I didn't want to use a secondary fabric. I wanted to maximize the entire pattern, so I put my pocket bag pattern in the template. But they were doing it from the very, very, very beginning. So it's interesting to see, but admittedly, the denim that they used was a 10 ounce. It wasn't a heavy 12 or 14 or whatever that we use now. So it's quite interesting. But then the downside is these early, early garments weren't made that well. So everyone always um, prides themselves, like, yeah, fuck yeah, America made amazing. Half the time, not, not, not really. So this is a clear example of that. These are made by tailors. They could have easily run and felled the seams, but they decided to, to have it flat. And this is probably why they started to overlock and do other kind of uh, surging. So they wanted that flat seam rather than a bulky felled seam. So very early examples and some replica garments, you can clearly see if they followed it like properly, they've kept the, raw, they kept the seams raw. So I advise you, if you ever come across a replica garment, let's see if they pass the test and kept a raw, raw seam or not. Um, the stitch that we all know about, that we all use in this room, is a three by one right hand twill, it's right here. And then many people don't know, but actually it's all about how technical you are, weaving, knitting, kind of thing. You, sort of, you can weave any kind of pattern actually, it's just your imagination really. And the reason, the reason why we went for this particular pattern is purely to save money. Now I'm gonna say that again, to save money. Because they figured out a way of making an indigo garment where 30% of it is, it's, it's basically 70-30 kind of thing. So basically more of the indigo is on the face or on the presentation side and the rest is white. So they managed to do a weave where it's more indigo on one side. It's really, really clever. So they figured out this quite early on and they did a two by one first and then they, up after the 30s and 40s, they went for the, a three by one. But yeah, they figured out the formula really early to make jeans quickly and fast by doing this method. And also when it rips, it doesn't, it doesn't tear as much as more. It's quite clever. So it's a really clever, uh, um, weaving pattern that they came up with really, really early. And then lovely little details that I find out from all my historical like, research, chain stitch runoff. I love this detail. I see it on shirts. I see it on lots of nice things. But you know, I found out quite, you know, quite not recently, but many years ago, I found out, I found out that it's actually a detail from 
the early Jewish like tailors. When they were making these garments, you know, they're religious garments, they have these um, chain, chain switch like, run, sort of runoffs on the side, they put it on their workwear, workwear garments. So don't be afraid of adding these details back, back in. I do it all the time. I have no problem with it. I think it's beautiful. And you often find workwear garments with it on, and it's quite beautiful. Now, I remember I did this whole collection once, and the factory, they cut all the chain stitch runoff off. I was so upset. I went, you know, even a tech, I was so upset with them. But, you know, especially when you do something like be that beautiful, and you spend a lot of time, and then they cut it off. Anyway, sad. Um, selvage, selvage, selvage. Um, now, I actually now don't really care about selvage. Sorry. I know it's a sacrilege thing I've said. I'm even wearing selvage today. But I've come to a conclusion, this is only a recent conclusion, that actually I would rather see the fabric being made in a really good mill, workers that are treated properly, fibers that I can trace, no polyester. Um, the, the workers thing is the most important thing. I get so upset when I find out a fabric's made and there's some kid involved in it or the picking is done by someone. It's not transparent enough. So if it can be selvage, that's a win-win for me. But actually nowadays, I would prefer to know exactly how it's made. I'm more interested in the fibers that they're using. Is it a tensile? Is it a like renewer cell? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it a recycled fiber? Which, you know, all these things are quite important to me now. But don't be afraid to walk away from it. I know it's a beautiful thing and I'm wearing it. It's lovely. But, you know, if you can pick a, a fabric which is you know where it's come from and it's, it's better for everyone involved, go with that one. Um, but then back in the day, they didn't care about selvage either. You know, they didn't. You know, you, you come across workwear garments where the selvage is literally r run and felled away. This is a garment where they've buttered them together and put a twin needle down it. You know, this is a 19, 1900s garment. So back in the day, they used selvage for one thing only, for, for strength. You would always find selvage on the coin pockets, on the, any kind of pocket area where you put your hands in in certain areas, even down the side seam, easier for the pattern cutting, for strength. You would never waste it either. So if you've got a bit of selvage left over, you put it somewhere where you know the hands are going to be working. So it's e interesting to find that. And uh, yeah, now we're going to go over to lots of cool patent drawings I've been finding. So the 1860s period, so let's just put our mind to it now. The denim gene is not, invent not invented yet. So we're now working, looking at tailoring garments, a horse riding, military, some um, obviously a work, uh, workwear too. You know, the original garment that we have for a jean is just a tailored pants with a bit of padding like sort of in the middle of it. So it's quite interesting. So these early garments were pantaloons with split back yokes, which is quite, quite, quite interesting, high waisted. Some of them were also like full fronts as well. The full front disappeared around the 1850s mark. So we started getting the fly then. So it's quite fun to see. And then Levi's came about in this magic period where in the 1870s, so a lot, of ha a lot of details changed. A lot of evolution happened in that period as well. Levi's didn't standardize their gene yet. The standard gene that we all wear today was standardized around 1922. That's when the first belt loop was put on. So up until then, a lot of things were still moving about. Even this one here has a little hammer pocket on it, which is quite awesome. So, you know, it's quite beautiful to see. And, and also, no belt loops yet as well. This is the 1870s uh, duck garment, two by two. Um, it's quite funny. Remember I said to you, duck and denim. So these were the two fabrics they were using right at the beginning. And this was the actual tent material that they were, they were using, that they were giving to the actual like, prospectors as well. So it's the same material that Levi Strauss was actually like, using. And there's so many good patents you can find. You know, the moment you go down this r rabbit hole, and it literally, literally is a rabbit hole, I, I was on a patent website typing in uh, names of really old defunct companies and finding so much information about disease and then finding out styles that people have found to cross-reference. Cross There's a lot of us. There's only probably a dozen designers like me, probably half a dozen, who are into this level of work, really. And we all share knowledge as well, which is quite awesome. This is the um, 1880 like, Nevada gene, the very famous like, Nevada gene that Levi's have in their archive. Still natural indigo at this, at this point. Natural indigo was phased out around 1897. So still natural sort of indigo. And then you know, beautiful styles in the 1880s. A lot of clever cinch, de cinch details. Everyone was coming up with clever details. Obviously, these were made for miners. People were bending down. Things are exposed. They're coming up with clever ways you know, to enhance the garment so it's easier to wear. So a lot of clever uh, like progression. And all of this happened because of the Levi's patent. So people were coming up with ingenious new ways of making garments to go against like Levi's, to, sit, to outsell Levi's. Obviously, they couldn't. The, the juggernaut had the company that they are. Even beautiful cinch, cinch styles there. Split back yokes are still sort of possible. L clever details around the knee. Obviously, they're on their knees a lot. 
which is quite interesting. Quite interesting. Lots, of, like, re lots of reinforcement around the crotch as well. So all these, these are the things that we find nowadays, you know, jeans that wear down. We should be inventing new crotch reinforcements that aren't that obvious, you know. And then another thing that they were do doing was lots of dart stitching. We saw it on the earlier garment here, but this one's quite interesting. It's got a leather uh, place there with a dart, dart stitch, so it's quite fun. Even when it fades away and the leather falls off, you've still got the evidence of the dart stitch too. And again, this is a magical twin needle. And look, look how it's made. It's all wonky. Back then, you know, they, things weren't made that well. You know, and everyone who prides themselves at making a beautiful garment. Actually, I did a collection called Bass Recast a few years ago for lensing. And I actually, I have a really, like a, like a, a like sort of Rolls Royce or Mercedes Benz of lock stitch machines. I can program the stitch to anything I like. So every few stitches it jumps, or every few stitches it misses a stitch. So I actually programmed my machine to do all these weird kind of shitty stitches. And I designed the whole collection. No one knew about it. I, they just thought I should sewed it really badly, and now a designer in the US saw it, and he goes, oh my god, you, you actually did that, because it looks amazing, it looks like, exactly. So I only know that from the types of garments that I was, re I was, I was like referencing. I couldn't have a pristine twin needle stitch, so I had to do a wonky and miss a stitch, and yeah, it's quite funny. But yeah, it's, if you're going to go to that level of detail, lots of, oh my god, you can, it's like going on Instagram and staying on it for f six hours. You can find so many amazing de de details, no AI help here. This is just pure research that I'm, that I'm doing. And it's so inspiring. And half of these things are lost to time. We haven't got the actual original garments anymore. We've just got patent drawings. Some of them people have found, and we've got pictures against them. But some of these ingenious little like, details, or coming up details, are, are beautiful. You know, also, a like, continuous fly by R. Gibbons here in 1881. He did his own version to go against uh, you know, the, the, the guys at but or boss of the road. Beautiful details, and this is a detail. This is a garment that um, a patent that uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ben in Canada, uh, uh, via Piana, he found the patent, and he goes, "I'm going to have a go, in my have a go, do my own interpretation of this style." So he did his own version of it, you know, and he, you know, he put 3D belt loops in. He, he grew on, he grew on from the. He even put uh, duck fabric inside uh, the the bearer, you know, the the bearer part or the facing part. He put it on there too, and his his interpretation of this. So I thought it was a great, you know, it's not a copy, he just got inspired by it. And it's so beautiful that when you get inspired by something and you go down this avenue, it's the original, it's still the original and you, you love it, but you don't need to copy it, just get inspired by it. So it's quite beautiful. And then, yeah, the woo pants. I've got this, I've got a sample of this. I've got a sample this big. I think it's, it's of this pocket detail and a little bit of the back. And I'm going to do a project with probably six students um, and we're gonna, it's still in its bag, it's still got dust from the um, mine, it's caked on with mud, so we're gonna carefully wash it, we're gonna splay it out, we're gonna pattern cut it, and together we're gonna figure out the rest of the style because we have the patent drawing. So it's a fun project that I'm gonna do with a group of students, so I'll let them try and figure out, because we've got styles, we know about the fits already in this period, so we're halfway there, so it's quite fun. Um, now we're in the 1890s period, this is, there was a recent auction that went, um, that this particular style, not this one, but a similar one, went for 100,000 or 75,000 plus tax, it was nearly 100. It was this version, it was the 1890s Levi's, but it was actually a 201, it wasn't the 501. So it was the cheaper variant of that jean. But this is one, it's quite interesting. So there's no um, uh, left pocket yet, no belt loops yet. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. It nearly looks like the jean that we have to have, have today, minus the cinch and the belt loops. So we, we're, we're actually getting there. And then also in the same period, we're still getting a lot of split backs. So you see a lot of the split back like details in styles, which are quite awesome to see. I did a few split back details quite recently, quite recently on, a, on a collection. And then we have Levi's own spring bottom pant, the very, very famous pant, um, which they have in, their, have in their archive, which is also their own version of a split back pant. So it's quite fun. And then we have this dark period where we don't know who designed it. There's loads of jeans like this. This particular one, uh, my friend John, um, he, he came across it, uh, John, like sort of like Lucknow, and he decided to replicate it and get inspired by the original. So this is the original, and that's his copy. But we have no idea who made it. There's no tags, buttons all gone. Remarkable, amazing, chunky style. It could be a British like, military style. It could be a German style. Uh, you know, you can tell it's obviously some kind of wearing, some kind of need access to those pockets, but they need to be hard wearing. So, you know, they've got that big old um, uh, pocket pocket like patch on there, pocket like a, a, a placket on there, which is quite amazing. And then, you know, we're getting more of these curved back de de details now in this period. 
which is quite awesome. And then lots of square pockets. I see a lot of G-Star like references, British like military like references. Don't believe all these people that say they invented stuff. They clearly, they didn't. They got inspired by things like this. So yeah, and then more, and then main to the French period as well. And these early French chore styles or moleskin styles, they actually were heavily, Ill, heavily influenced by the denim styles. A lot of cross-pollination. You can see if you come across these styles, and you do come across them still, one or two of them have got a one-piece fly. And that one-piece fly was invented by a denim design, by a denim company. So this is a denim detail that went back to France. So lots of cross like sort of pollination so happening here in French farmers' gear, quite fun. And then this is now work where now we're going into more railroad um, sort of um, style styling, and it's quite beautiful, more chunkier sort of styles. And these styles are also very very beautiful. Now they're being made really really well. We've got twin needle twin needle machines go going on now. And then yeah, beautiful details in, in like the in like twenties. And then we got our British styles. Well, in England we were making denim. It wasn't blue, it was green. So it was green and brown, really. So yeah, we're making it in Derby, British Indian cotton. Um, obviously, most likely now, now from Pakistan, but it was, it was India, India back then. So it's quite, quite, quite interesting. Woven in Derby. A lot of curved, curved details are quite beautiful, too. I referenced a style quite recently, similar like this. You know, beautiful cowboy kind of. You can tell this is the 50s. This is, this is deep, deep, like, cowboy sort of period now, or just, just after that period. So a lot of influencing going on, especially with the pockets and things. So it's, it's influenced, the, influenced the scoop pocket now, which is quite fun. Now, you can't talk about making jeans without talking about some of the details again. So each jean most likely has maybe three or four or even five different thicknesses of thread. You probably never realize this until you actually go and make a jean yourself. From the types of thread you need for the, for the belt loop machine, to the bar tap machine, to your heavy duty, duty, heavy duty lock stitch machine, you might need heavier stitching around the pockets or in the inseam. It's, it's actually a balancing game. You can use the same thread for all of it, but something's going to go wrong. Oh, it will look a bit flat as well. And thread colors as well. You know, it's something that um, I discovered for myself. Um, having bought a lot of styles in my early period and now buying a lot of really vintage styles, I've come to the conclusion, earlier you go, the more paler and uh, natural colors you get. So we're talking ecrus, those kind of colors. The, the tobacco colors were there. Of course they were there because the early garments were duck color. So they also used a color that was similar to the duck color. So that probably maybe could be where the tobacco stitch actually came from, left over the, the cone that they're using for the duck garment they just used on the inner garment. Not too sure, but may, maybe. There's a big, big, big asterisk there. But don't be afraid if you're a designer to mix up your colors. Whenever I buy any kind of denim, I often put my favorite colors like, through it. And I often put my favorite colors through it and wash it and see if the colors still look good. So it's quite fun. And then don't be afraid to look at your stitch per inches. This is quite interesting. Um, every garment that I design, I often analyze what stitch per inch. Is it an old style? Is it a modern style? Is it a vintage inspired style? This style is a Levi's jean from 19, 1910. My eyesight's not very good anymore. So I photographed it. And then on the computer screen, I counted the stitches. And it was about 17 SBI. If you go to any factory nowadays, you probably don't even talk about SBI. You just say, copy this or make this. They'll automatically give you nine or eight, or if you're unlucky, six. You know, they'll just give you the highest, the lowest number is the fastest way to make a pant. It's like, brr, it's really fast. So, you know, but if you go to 12 or 14 SBI, it's a bit more, takes a bit more longer. You have to adjust your thread thickness, and it looks 50 times better. Again, a detail that doesn't cost any extra money. Just a little bit more time for the factory, which they won't like. Um, I love analyzing different types of stitching, different types of uh, whips of stitches, and becoming uh, working for a lot of American companies, I figured out maybe 12 years ago, I'm, I was really against it at the time. I went to work for like DKNY jeans. Um, up until that point, I was only working for English companies, and they said, Morsen, we only work in inches in this company. And I was like, what? Properly freaked out. But within one or two days, one of the other younger interns she explained to me about inches and how to, how to read an inch ruler. I've never wor wor worked it out. But once I mastered it, plain sailing. And actually, everything started to make sense from the garment that I'm wearing. Oh, wow, that's a, that's a 3 16th edge stitch. That's a 1 8th, a twin needle that goes down to one point. That's a 5, that's a five 16th like twin needle. You start reading in measurements, and I never did it before. And the moment you master it, it completely opens up. You start looking at garments in a completely different way. And then you start making your conclusions, going, oh, I don't like the 5 16th. And the detail that a stitch that I fell in love with 
was the magical 316th. This is a detail that no longer exists. If you go to any factory, any modern day factory and say, hey, I want my twin needling on my trucker jacket to be 316th, they'll go, oh, sorry, sir, it has to be a quarter or a 516th. Um, you know, they haven't got the machine for it. So what I did is I went and bought all of the machines that do all, especially that twin needle stitch, I wanted that twin needle. But you can do it by double, you can do it by hand, but you have to go for it twice. But I wanted that twin needle 316, which I've got now in a flat lock and a triple needle and a chain stitch and a lock stitch version. Yeah, men, men, mental. Um, continuous stitches, this is something that, something that I think is an amazing like, detail, which no one talks about. It's, it's something that, it's like an unspoken, Thing that happens in factories, and I hope all of you put continuous stitches in your collections. This is a, a Levi's garment. I think it's a, a World War II. No, it's not World. It's it's it's, a, it's an old Levi's garment. I have to put a date in there, but yeah, it's a Big E style. And you can clearly see on the underside. You can see when they were doing the leather, when they were doing the waistband stitch, they went round the whole leather patch and came off again. They did it to save time. And then I do it now in my own collections. When I make any collections, I always do it with a continuous stitch, and I teach. I teach all my students to do the same thing. I say to them, don't tell me where it is, put a continuous stitch somewhere in that garment. So even if it's around the coin pocket or around the shirt pocket or even going around the waist, waist the leather patch in a funny way, put it, some, put it somewhere. And I keep on discovering it. You know, this is something that is amazing. It just, just, I discovered this only probably about six months ago. It's a vintage style. Um, it's from the 1870s. Um, and you can see the waistband stitch, it catches the cinch buckle and goes off again. I had to do a detailed drawing of the direction because I had to figure out how they did it. And it is done with a continuous stitch, which is genius. So it saves time, none of this stopping and starting. So yeah, more in, more in my book in like October. I'm giving away things now. So this is beautiful. I love misstitches, I love mistakes. And don't be afraid to add mistakes in any of the garments that you create. Um, it naturally happens when you have a twin needle machine any, any, anyway. Especially if you put the lever in a, in a diff different way, you can create these diamonds or mist stitches. So don't be afraid to do it. It's a beautiful detail. And more details that I keep on coming across that are beautiful that I've put in my own collection. This is a detail that I don't know the official name. I call it a turn, turn back. Don't know what the official name is. But when they do the waistband, they leave it a bit longer. They cut it. They turn it in on itself and they clean it up. So it's a really non hard way of doing it. It's a really simple way, less stressful. And yeah, I did it in one of my early collections, but I did it with selvage, which was quite funny. Um, and again, hidden selvages, you can find them everywhere if you really look hard, you know. In um, a tool pocket was a selvage detail. Of course, in a coin pocket, that's more common. We often find a selvage on coin, coin pockets. But don't be afraid. Obviously, I love uh, full front styles as well. These are details that are coming in fashion again in the, in the last three or four years. We're seeing a lot of full front styles. But I've been a keen admirer of full fronts for many, many years. And I've, been, I've collected quite a few of them now. I've probably got about 10. 10 different examples of full front styles, both men's and ladies. Quite beautiful styles for reference when you do a denim collection. That's a collection I did for like Navina, which was using a full front inspired collection. And the pocket bag is turned in, 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 in on itself, which is quite beautiful. And then, um, so, you know, zero waste. This is something that um, I've been talking about for a few years as well. This is actually one of my students, actually, from like, sort of, from like St. Martin's, who just graduated a few months ago, did a zero waste collection. He decided to use a fabric roll and pattern cut his entire garment still on, the, on it. He got lots of awards. He, he, you know, he did really well. Okay, that's interesting, but that's not what I'm talking about. This is you know, it's beautiful, but what I'm talking about is this. I'm talking about being super clever about zero waste. I'm talking about engineering a garment that looks like a garment, but there's hardly no waste in the lay plan. That to me is zero waste. Anyone who talks about, I'm using the off cuts to make you know, a bag or I'm doing something, no, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about eliminating all of the yellow. That's still the waste, by the way. I did versions without the, the, the yellow, but pattern cutting the entire garment off one bit of like, fab, fab, or fabric, and you can do it if you even do it with a jacquard loom, you can do it, so you can do it. So it's really interesting. But this is an example of me doing a denim making class. And this is David here. And more than 30 to 40% of the fabric was wasted on how he cut it. How he cut it. You know, I made a jean with hardly no wastage at all. And you wouldn't tell. It still looked, still looked like a normal jean. So don't be afraid of pushing it. I did it with a trucker jacket and a chore jacket and a skirt pattern. I did it with loads. But something that interests me as a designer, and there's a, this, is, this, this is coming. There's only one or two mills that have experimented with it. Diamond Denim have, only because I introduced them to the young designer who wanted to do it. So 
This young, there's a couple of designers, they're all in the Netherlands. This is a, a, a trucker jacket that was all zero waste. The entire style was done with jacquard weaving. So basically, you're, you're, you're weaving multiple layers at the same time. So this is a jean pattern. You just cut this seam and you have your pocket bag already. So it's just being super clever about it. Thing is, the designers that are designing it, they're not denim designers. They're just designers, which is fine. So they don't know about twin needle stitching and the elegance of a pocket or the shape of a beautiful fly. They just do a nice style. You know, for me, so I would like denim designers to explore this because it's super. But in, in, and here's the one that Holly like McCrillan did. It's an actual pant, which is completely zero waste. I can't share the pattern, but literally, it's just a pattern. Then you cut it once or twice, and it's a jean. And it's woven like that. The only way to describe it is like the Nike fly knit thing. It's the only way to describe it, but it's not that. Multiple layers. And she was actually at ITMA a few weeks ago talking to the machinery companies to try and convince them to make a machine that can do even more crazier stuff than this, which does exist especially for, um, you know, uh, for the automated in industry. They're making 3D knitted sculptured garments. Denim isn't that far away, especially if you put an indigo a filament through it. Need to know your fibers. I keep on telling young designers this. You know, yes, everyone knows about organic cotton. Organic cotton is only 1%. 1% of what's going on. Forget organic cotton. It's, not, you know, it's so unreachable now. So there's other things that we can be doing. You know, is it using a tensile ISL? Is it using organic? Is it using a cottonized hemp, either from China or from our friends in, in France? Is it going ahead and using like recycled fibers only? These are the things that we should really be looking at and not looking at polyester at all. I'm so against it. And you know, there is this whole cotton versus hemp debate. Yeah, to be honest, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when you look, 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 look at the facts. These facts, are, the, are they are made by hemp people, so you have to be quite careful. So caution here. Three to four months to grow, eight to nine, no pesticides. But the water usage is the main one. So 3,700 liters to make one gene, 2,600 of that is just on growing on cotton alone. So if you ended up going with hemp, you would eliminate that water usage quite over quickly. So it's interesting, and you can have a cottonized hemp now, which looks pretty much like cotton. Um, I have a cottonized hemp. So, you know, it's just whether or not if it's scoured or not. We have to be quite careful because um, some of our friends are using chemicals to make it more soft, and we can't be using that one. It's very crucial. Very crucial. So my main one of the last things I'm going to talk about is polyester. Now I, you know, I'm really against it. If you've seen any of my slides, I keep on updating the slide. I've I've modernised it now. But you know, it's it's I joke about it, but it, it's it's so alarming. You know, this is a, a, a label that should be in every garment. You know, warning, this garment contains polyester, which is a fiber-like derivative of crude oil, sheds microplastics, burn like machine washed, harmful if swallowed. This should be in every single Puma, Nike, Adidas, any polyester garment around here. It should be a tag in every single garment, but it's not. This is the next cancer that we're going to face, to be honest. Um, and, you know, they, they found polyester particle, particles in blood, found it in breast milk, they found it in newborn babies. It, so, you know, nothing really to say about it, really. I'm, if, you, if you know me and you follow me, I'm often, um, I'm often uh, highlighting really crap projects. This one alarms me the most recently, is the, the Jeans redesign project with Primark. Goodness me, um, what a load of shite it was. Then somehow they got the license, I call it a license here, to get their logo to put on the garment. It was polyester garment. It was made in the most hideous way. I didn't influence anything here. I bought the garment and took a, took a picture of it. All the thread was polyester. I took it apart. It had interlining inside, which was polyester. Nothing can be recycled about this garment. Nothing. And they say it's 100% recyclable. Everyone was amazed by it. Lots of great campaigns about it. What a load of shite. And in the end, I think about 30,000 people commented about it. Um, Ellen MacArthur Foundation had to had to write a statement about what I wrote. That's how, how alarming it was. So, you know, it was quite funny. I found it really amusing because they backed it. So, a load of shite, really. And then, for me, it's, the future is all about elegance. It's all, I love tailoring. I, I, I love all this women's wear that I'm creating with lots of my students. It's, it's something quite beautiful that's happening in the denim world, which people in this room don't know, don't know about, really. So, it's like, there's some amazing students that are coming through that are using denim in the most remarkable way which is so beautiful. Many of my students, I teach at like 30 different colleges now, and it's quite mad, but my favorites are the masters. They, they already know how to sew. They know, about sew, they know about pattern cutting, so they just go wild on using denim. And washed as well, it's quite amazing. 
And um, yes, I am doing a couple of books. They're both going to be out this winter. The first one's going to be about how to make a pair of jeans. It's going to be quite awesome. And then the next one's about one of my archives. I'm doing an archive book every year. I've got 3,000 vintage garments, and I've already photographed about 300 pieces. So I'm releasing a book every year now about my archive every, every winter. So every, a book a year for me, it's going to be quite fun. But the first one is about making jeans, and I'll be doing a follow-up trucker jacket one too. Uh, but yeah, happy birthday, Blue Zone. Goodness me, 20 years. Well, well, well done, thank you. They've been a big supporters of mine. Going back five, six years, I've been coming here. So it's been really fun uh, doing talks for these guys. And they're, they're very, always very nice to me and, and, and paying for my hotel and doing nice things like this. So it's really, um, they're just super, super, super nice. And I really like them a lot. And that's me. If you ever want to contact me, you can do. I've got four different Instagrams. Um, if, you know, each of them are different. The denim history one's about my educational work. My personal one's about me and my cat, probably. And then the Endrime one's Endrime. And Endrime Studio is all the consultancy we do with the, the bosses and the Navinas and the, the, and the lensings of the world. So yeah, um, thank you so much for your time. Now, any questions? There will be a microphone somewhere. I'm sure you might not have any quite questions. Any questions at all? There's a microphone right there. Or oh, someone's bringing you one. This one? So what do you think about recycled polyester? I think that's a load of crock as well. Yeah? Yeah, 100%. You can't recycle it again. But it, it you're only it, using it's not, organic... It's not circular, dude. It, yeah. it won't go anywhere. Yeah. You're using it like our friend... There's lots of friends like uh, Christopher, Christopher Rayburn who love polyester. It's the evil, the evil thing. We shouldn't even be, forget about recycling again. You can't use it. You stopped it. You can't recycle it again, so it becomes waste again. But for some tearing issues, when you're only using organic, it's a lower stable length than uh, common? Honestly, I'm, you're speaking to the person... You, you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about, yeah. but it, it's, it's all crock, in my opinion. Yeah. Now, I'm an independent designer. No. I haven't got any big company behind me telling me what to say. So I can be independent and tell you, recycled polyester is a load of crap. So I wouldn't go near it. Okay, thank you. Mm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Anyway, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for all being here. Thank you so much. You're very, very kind.